Uh, good evening, everyone, and welcome to our um, council meeting of Tuesday, November 13th, 2018. If you'd please stand for the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Uh, roll call, please. Mayor Ziegler? Here. Deputy yes. Mayor Beagle is excused. Councilmember Gottschall? Here. Councilmember Kennedy is excused. Councilmember Leader? Here. Councilmember Resnick? Here. Councilmember Smiley? Here. Quorum present. Thank you. Um, are there any changes to the agenda, Mr. Brown? Yeah, a couple of things to note, Your Honor. Uh, number one, there are a couple of uh, corrections to the uh, dates either reflected or not reflected under the consent agenda number one uh, and then I provided a uh, slightly revised uh, version of the new business item number three report that corrects uh, or tightens up the language on it that uh, we should act on instead of what was provided in fact every one. Very good. Those two things. Anybody up here have any changes, additions? Okay, thank you. Um, first thing on the agenda um, this evening is the uh, reaffirmation by Eric Hess of his oath of office as a police officer and his introduction to the mayor and city council. So, Good evening, mayor, members of council. Eric and Kelsey, if you could please come up and join me at the lectern. As I say every time I do this, one of my favorite things to do as the police chief is to introduce to the mayor and to members of council our new police officers, our, our new additions to the Wixom Police Department family. And tonight I'm, I'm proud and I'm pleased to introduce to you, mayor and, and members of council, uh, officer, police officer Eric Hess and his lovely new bride, Kelsey, uh, recently married, so I think that's worthy of a round of applause. And Mayor, we have some special um, guests in the audience, if, if I may introduce them, if they could either stand or, or wave. Uh, Eric's mom and dad are here from Indiana. They came up just for the reaffirmation. Carolyn and Martin Hess. Eric's mother-in-law and father-in-law, Kim and Jim Fiscus. And Eric's sister-in-law, Kristen Fiscus. And now, if I may, I'd, I'd like to take just a couple moments to tell you a little bit about our, our newest police officer. Eric Hess was born and raised in northern Indiana. And after graduating from high school, he attended Kellogg Community College on a baseball scholarship. From there, Eric attended Grand Valley State University, where he achieved a Bachelor of Science degree in criminal justice. In 2015, Eric graduated from the Wayne County Regional Police Academy, right here in Michigan. And he worked for over two years as a police officer in good standing in Brownstown Township. Eric saw an opportunity to work closer to his home in Novi. And he and his new wife, Kelsey, are excited about the possibility to work so close to their home. I'm looking forward to being a part of this great Lakes Area community. <coughs> when we offered Eric a conditional offer of employment, uh, as a Wixon police officer, Eric and Kelsey gladly accepted. In fact, when Lieutenant Mike DeRozier contacted Eric to tell him that everything appeared to be going well with the application process, I believe Eric and Kelsey were on the rim of a volcano somewhere in Hawaii on their honeymoon <laughs> when they received the text message from Lieutenant DeRozier. Mayor, in my opinion, the Wixon Police Department in the city would benefit greatly from Mr. Eric Hess's appointment as a Wixon police officer. He exhibits all the characteristics that we've come to expect from, uh, from our community and from our police department members. Mayor, at this time, I'd, I'd like to have Kelsey pin the badge on Eric just prior to us doing the reaffirmation of vote. Please do. You've practiced this, I trust. <laughs> <laughs> we always practice this, yes. Right. 
Madam Clerk, if you would please administer the oath of office. You solemnly swear that you will support the Constitution of the United States of America, the Constitution of the State of Michigan, the Charter and Ordinances of the City of Wixom, Oakland County, Michigan, and that you will faithfully discharge the duties and responsibilities of the police officer according to the best of your ability. I will. And with that, Mayor, I'm, I'm proud to announce for the very first time to the public, uh, Police Officer Eric Hess. Well, thank you very much. We look forward to seeing you around the streets and uh, uh, helping everybody out. It's great. Um, as we uh, usually do in circumstances like this, we usually adjourn for a few moments, and everybody here is uh, uh, welcome to uh, um, participate in a little reception that we'll have in the back. We've got some cake and other refreshments, um, so feel free to, to uh, uh, come back and talk to the, uh, the new officer and introduce yourself and uh, enjoy a piece of cake with us. We'll adjourn for about 15 minutes, okay? Very good, thank you. Thanks for coming out tonight. Good. You. you know. Okay. Um, let's see. Um, next up on the agenda is a uh, public hearing uh, to solicit community input regarding the utilization of the 2019-20 Community Development Block Grant Program allocation. Deanna, sure. As many of you recall and have gone through this process before, um, tonight is public hearing for the Community Development Block Grant Program. Um, for those of you that do not know, the program funds um, low to moderate, it, older homes, revitalizing neighborhoods, providing human services and rebuilding infrastructures for low to moderate residents. The qualifying projects or public services <coughs> are located on two census tracts that are south of Pondman Trail. At this time, anyone that is interested, once the mayor opens the public hearing, um, may present it. Okay, thank you, Deanna. Um, what I'll do to begin with is uh, read the rules uh, for a public hearing. Uh, Persons desiring to address the council shall state their name and address. Individual persons shall be allowed five minutes to address the council. There shall be no questioning by, by the audience of the persons addressing the council. However, the council may uh, question persons addressing the council. No person shall be allowed to address the council more than once. Uh, the only um, caveat, I guess, that I would say after reading those aloud, it's, uh, my, it's my belief uh, that, that really the council does not ask questions during the public, public hearing. So um, if we don't ask you questions, it's not because we're not interested, it's just the way the rules are. Um, so having said that, I'll open the uh, public hearing. So anybody would like to come up and address us uh, regarding their programs, please feel free to come up. Good evening, my name is Donovan Neal. I reside at 1299 Pennarf Street in Commerce, Michigan. I'm the Executive Director of Hospitality House Food Pantry located here in Commerce. Hospitality House feeds um, over 550 households every month, of which six Wixom citizens um, make up the second largest beneficiary of our services. And before I continue, I do want to take some time to publicly thank the Wixom um, Police Department and Public Safety Officer Ron Moore in particular for their efforts um, this year in helping us collect toys uh, for the many children that we serve. I want to specifically ask the council to approve our submitted 2018-2019 CBDG request of $4,000. And each year I attempt to advocate for food insecure uh, in our local community before this council. And this year I thought instead of boring you with statistics, I would share with you simply just two stories represented by almost the hundred um, testimonies that I have here before me. Um, one comes from Anna Elizabeth and she says that Hospitality House has helped my family have complete meals. It has made it so I can buy meat and dairy products for our house. 
Um, living on disability, it makes it hard to provide food after my bills are paid. Now I don't have to pick up, pick between rent, Medicare, excuse me, rent, medicine, or food. Hospitality House provides more than Raymond to our family. We are grateful and appreciate all Hospitality House provides for us. Renee writes, there has literally been days when I didn't have money for a loaf of bread. I craved the taste of meat or fresh fruit or vegetables. Hospitality House came to my rescue. I always at least have something to eat in my home because of them. With the recipes they give, I can utilize everything they give in some type of creative way. Again, this is just two of the many hundreds of testimonies that I have um, with Hospitality House. And again, we just want to advocate on behalf of those here within the city itself and again, even locally within the Lakes region. I want to take the time again to say thank you to the City Council um, for this evening and your efforts in helping to combat food insecurity here in the city of Wixom and regionally here as well. Thank you very much. Thank you. Anybody else? Good evening. I'm Jasmine Valentine. Um, I'm the development manager at Haven, and the address is 801 Vanguard Drive in Pontiac, Michigan, 48341. And before I start, I brought some material for you all. And what I just um, handed to Councilman Brent is just our um, 2017 fact sheet and our brochure. That includes everything, all of the services that we have at, <clears throat> at Haven. Um, you all are aware of the agency of Haven, but anyone in the audience, Haven is a, the only comprehensive agency that serves um, victims of domestic violence and sexual assault and their children that are involved. Um, last year, or this past fiscal year, we actually serviced 23 Wixom residents, and that included um, using our counseling program, which is in-house. We actually managed the personal protection order at the Oakland County Sheriff Department um, near us, and we also provide court advocacy that we helped out eight victims, and we also have in-house at our agency, we have a START program that is essentially like a forensic exam, or most people know it as rape kits. Um, as we all know, domestic violence and sexual assault affects um, every part of someone's life that is influencing this. So with the money that you have provided us and that we hope that you do for the next year will enable us to ensure that the services that we provide to our community are free of charge. Um, and I just want to thank you all, um, the council members and um, the mayor, for actually allowing us to do this or come and speak to you all. Because um, again, the money that you allocated to us we do use and we appreciate it a lot. So um, just thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? My name is Ann McCarville and I live in Walt Lake. And I belong to the St. William Conference of St. Vincent de Paul. We provide emergency assistance to everyone in our church boundary areas, um, delay utility shutoffs, arrange financial assistance, help with rent payments, provide grocery, grocery route vouchers. We refer to other community agencies. We help with budgeting. We arrange for camp experiences. and. Over the 20 years that I've been in St. Vincent, I've been in Wixom more than Walt Lake. So, but we've appreciated all your help over the years. We reviewed our spreadsheet, <coughs> and for uh, the past year, from June 17 to July 18, we helped 23 cases. Those cases represented 51 individuals and 13,000 in assistance. The hours and mileage numbers are recorded but are accounted with all the other communities we uh, serve. We serve the church boundaries of Wixom, Novi, Commerce Township, and uh, Walt Lake. And we appreciate your help in the past. We need the, we get our money from the poor boxes at church but it runs real low and by now we have like 
couple thousand left to make it through the holidays and put people's heat back on and their rent and all. So thank you. Thank you. Good evening, I'm Bridget Ojemian, uh, 3038 White Oak Beach, Highland, Michigan. I am the program director for Western Oakland Meals on Wheels, and we serve homebound seniors uh, throughout all of Western Oakland County, specifically in Wixom. Last year we served 55 seniors, and what it means to be homebound is you don't drive, and you really can't get out, you can't go shopping, or anything like that, but you choose to age in place. And Aging in place is <coughs> by bringing um, services such as Meals on Wheels, uh, it costs the community about $30,000, and by putting them in a nursing home is about $75,000. So it's a substantial savings. They're happier. Nobody wants to go to a nursing home. Um, our program serves uh, seniors on a daily basis, Monday through Friday, and we deliver more than just a meal. We show up at the door, we provide socialization, we provide a warm, uh, friendly face for them to see when uh, a lot of times they don't have anybody. We intercede where the family isn't able to or, as I just mentioned, when there isn't any family. Um, the hot meal provides nourishment for them and keeps them away from worrying about uh, not, having, not having a meal. Um, we would always like to provide more meals than just one because most of them do eat just one meal a day. They usually get the hot meal, they'll eat some then, and then they'll save the rest for dinner. Um, we appreciate the opportunity to speak with you and ask for your support with CD, DGB, and uh, we appreciate the support, and that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, my name is Vicki Kennedy. I'm from an um, agency called Common Ground. Um, I brought some brochures for you guys to um, check them out. I wanna thank you for the opportunity for uh, letting us come here and ask um, for your continued support to help people in crisis. Um, we are in uh, mental health agency we've been uh, helping people move from crisis to hope for over 47 years um, we have added a lot to uh, common grounds um, eight, uh, since we opened we have a, a shelter for youth homeless youth we uh, have an emergency center for people who are not safe to make it through the night um, we have a victim's assistance program where we uh, do have people that go to court for you uh, with you, they advocate for you for any kind of crime. Mm -hmm. um, we have an adult treatment center, and um, last year I do have one copy of um, the people that we helped through Wixom. Um, if you guys want to see that, I'm not sure if you you have a copy of that. Um, I sent it we to don't. Deanna a while ago. Maybe you could give it to Deanna and she could share it with us afterwards. Okay. Sounds great. Um, I know that um, it's really important that we stay uh, funded to help all the people in crisis. And again, I just uh, thank you for always uh, helping us out and um, doing what you do. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay, seeing no one else coming up, uh, um, I'll close the public hearing. Thank you. Um, next item on the agenda is we have a presentation this evening on the uh, update of the SAW grant. Your Honor, we have uh, Karen Stickle, who's representing uh, Upper Roth and Clark, who's going to go through the presentation for us this evening. Thank you. Thanks. Hi, Karen. Hi, everyone. Thanks, Steve. Thanks, everyone, for having me tonight. Um, appreciate the time. I am here to give an update on the SAW grant. I know we've been talking about SAW grant for the past three or four years and we're coming to the end of it. So this is a, kind of a wrap up of the SAW grant, everything that was done, the last few remaining steps before everything gets finalized on November 30th. So 
go through my presentation. We've been working a lot with Suez, with Matt, and with Tim to get everything finalized. So I'll go through the presentation at the end if you have any questions. We'll see if Matt or Tim have to come up here and answer them. Um, the agenda for the night, I'm going to go a little bit through the project background, the objectives of the grant, the work that's been completed to date, cost to date, the final steps that we're going to do, and then answer any questions that you guys have. <laughs> So as you may recall, in uh, December of 2013, the city applied for this grant. It's the SAW grant. SAW stands for Stormwater Asset Management and Wastewater. Um, and what the city applied for was to prepare an asset management plan for your wastewater system, including the treatment plant, and provide design services for one, one of your wastewater projects. Uh, the city was notified that you received the grant in October of 2015. The grant agreement was signed in November of 2015, and you had three work three years to complete all the work. So the deadline is November 30th uh, of this month, so just a few weeks away. The, uh, the grant amount was, um, the total project amount was two and a half million dollars. Of that, two million was grant money and then 500,000 was city match. Um, the, uh, the project timeline, like I said, everything needs to be completed by, May or by November 30th. That included a funding study, which had to be completed by uh, May 30th of 2018. That was done by Dawn Lund of UFS. She had presented on that, and we got that submitted by the May 30th deadline. And then the final asset management plan is, needs to be done by November 30th. Um, uh, the city has addressed the funding gap that was identified through the planned rate increases, so you're all set there. Uh, you'll have to submit a certificate of completion to MDEQ going to need to be signed and it says you did everything you said you were going to in the grant and we have to provide a three to five page summary to DEQ of everything that was done and they'll be posting that on their website. Um, I know they've done that for the first two rounds of grants. I haven't heard one comment from anyone about any of the summaries that have been posted so far but they're up there. And then the other, the final thing you have to do is have a copy of the full asset management plan available here at City Hall in case anyone from the public wants to come in and review it. Um, that needs to be available for 15 years. Again, we've finished a couple rounds of these grants. I don't think anyone's been knocking down the door to read these fascinating engineering reports, but we will get, uh, get the report over to the city to meet that requirement. Uh, so the primary objective of this grant for the city was to develop a comprehensive asset management plan for the sanitary sewer system which included an asset inventory and condition assessment for both the collection system and at the wastewater treatment plant. Um, looking at the level of service of the system, looking at the criticality of your assets, looking at o &M strategies and costs, and then looking at long-term funding and capital improvement planning. This also included a design project for the wastewater treatment plant. That design project, is for, it was for the sludge presses that went in. Um, the, the construction is complete and you're able to get 90% of the design money back through this grant program. So it was a good deal for a project that was going to be done anyway. Uh, so the work that's been completed to date, like I said, the design for the solids handling facility. For the asset management plan, we completed GIS mapping, manhole inspections, pump station inspections, televising of sanitary sewers, uh, a wastewater treatment plant condition assessment, an inflow and infl infiltration study, and then looked at the criticality of your assets, and then the level of service and funding study. Um, we're finalizing the capital improvement plan right now. We're basically complete for the collection system, and then we're finishing it up with the wastewater treatment plant right now. Uh, we ended up doing some, we had some money left over in the grant, so we decided to add in a few more inspections that we weren't necessarily originally anticipating. So those were done in the last month or so. So we're trying to finalize, wrap all of that into the capital improvement plan now. Uh, this is the design project, the solids handling facility. Like I said, we put in some sludge presses. So some photos of the final work that the design was paid for through this. Uh, the first thing we did on the asset management plan was GIS mapping. Before you can do any asset management planning, you need to know what your assets are and where they are. So the city already had started a GIS map, um, but we used the grant money to update that map. Um, and we also scanned and hyperlinked all of your engineering plans. So that's all online and people at the city can access that pretty easily now instead of going to a file and 
digging through paper trying to find the plans. They can click on a link and open up the plans for certain areas. Um, we overhauled the database, the GIS database, just made sure all the correct fields were in there. We added additional attributes such as age, material, other things that are needed for asset management planning. We did some GPSing of your system uh, to find out exactly where the assets are and corrected the mapping that way. And then we did criticality scoring um, based on the consequence of failure and condition of assets. I'll go a little bit into that later. Um, we also did manhole inspections. We were able to inspect about 88% of your manholes that um, was all of, we could only inspect ones that were constructed prior to 1993. So the, in the 12%, it's anything that was constructed after 1993. And it's also, with manholes, a lot of times, there's some we can't get access to. Either they're buried, they're on a fence property that won't let us in to access them. Um, they're in a parking lot, and every time we go out there, there's a car parked over them. There's just different, different reasons we can't always access every single one of them, and sometimes we just can't find them. So we were able to do a, about almost 90% of them. Most of them are in, fair con are in good condition, few in fair condition, and very few in poor condition. So we're working with Tim to get any immediate problems fixed. Um, these are just some photos of some typical issues that we find with manholes. The upper left is an adjustment ring that is starting to fall apart. Um, it's pretty common. The upper right is the manhole's offset. It's shifted. It was probably hit by a plow, hit by something to kind of knock it loose. Uh, the bottom left is roots and infiltration coming into the manhole. And then the bottom right is the manhole starting to shift a little bit and cause surface issues. So these are common problems that we see in manholes. But again, your manholes are in very good condition overall. We also did sewer televising. We worked with Metro um, televising to, to, to su televise your sewers. Again, we can only do things that were 1993 or older. And so we did about 96% of your system, almost 275,000 feet were televised as part of this grant. Um, most of them, again, 56% are in good shape. That's what the green is. PACP is Pipeline Assessment Certification Program. It's a standardized rating for pipes that NASCO puts out. So that's why we use those scores because they're standard across the nation. So it goes from one to five. One is in great shape, five is in poor shape. So for the most part, you're in good shape with your sewer system too. Again, there were, for, uh, were a few issues. Uh, Metro has already gone out and fixed some of those. Some of the more immediate needs were fixed as they were found, and then we're working with Tim to, to fix the rest of the major issues over the next couple of years. And these are just some examples of sanitary sewer televising issues that we find. Top left is some cracked, broken pipe. Top right, there's root intrusion into the pipe. Um, the bottom left, there's a piece of rebar sticking through the pipe, so that's something you find occasionally, not, not that often. And then the bottom right is a major infiltration source that's water coming into the pipe. So we want to remove any of that because that goes to the plant and needs to be treated. And it's clean water, so there's no need to treat it. So things like that, we did have Metro put on pipe patches in order to fix those major infiltration sources. Uh, the next thing we looked at for all of these assets was the probability of failure. So the probability of failure is how likely is this going to fail in the near future. In order to develop that, we looked at the condition of the Piper manhole, the age of the Piper manhole, the material, and the soils around it. So we basically put together an algorithm to say, based on the condition and age, we think it's got a one to five probability of failure, with one a very low probability, five a very high probability. Um, this is a map kind of showing where you're at. M most of yours are ones and twos, a couple threes, a couple fours. I don't think we ran across any fives on the system. And then the next thing we look at for asset management is the consequence of failure. So the consequence of failure is a number that does not change over time. It's that we say that this pipe, if it fails, 
it's going to have a lower high consequence of failure. So a, a sewer crossing Pontiac Trail has a higher consequence of failure than one at the end of a cul-de-sac because there's more impacts. It's more costly to repair. It, there's more impacts to traffic. There's just more impact in general if something like that fails. So we took into account the diameter of the pipe, the surface and road type, the depth of the pipe, wh and whether it was near a railroad or a waterway in order to determine con that consequence of failure. And that's again a number one to five. One is a low consequence of failure, five is a high consequence of failure. Um, we didn't identify any pipes that were a five consequence of failure, or, an, uh, or we, we identified a couple of pipes that were a five consequence failure, no manholes, and that's mostly because they either crossed a railroad track or were under a stream or wetland. We made those an automatic high consequence of failure if it was one of those two things. Um, and then what we do, we take those two numbers, the probability of failure, which is a one to five consequence of failure, one to five, and multiply them together. So we theoretically get numbers from 1 to 25. And then we use that number to prioritize what we want to look at. Because if it has a high likelihood of failure, a high consequence of failure, that's a higher priority. So um, most of your pipes, when we multiply those two numbers together, was less than 5. So you're in pretty good shape as far as consequence and probability of failure. Uh, we, did, we, we found that your sanitary sewer system and overall is in good, in good shape, your collection system. The next thing we did was an inflow and infiltration study. Uh, inflow and infiltration is again when you get non-sanitary flow into the pipe. So it's either infiltration through joints of groundwater or inflow is during a rain event. If you have a manhole lid that has holes in it, you get rainwater in there. If you have sump pumps from homes connected to the sanitary, you get rainwater in there. And again, Inflow and infiltration is something you want to try and eliminate because it causes issues at the plant and plus you're paying to treat water that doesn't need to be treated. So we put 10 meters around the city, this is kind of map showing where they are, and we identified any areas that had higher than average inflow or infiltration. And there were a couple areas that showed, uh, showed peaks when it rained or showed that the flow was a little bit higher than expected. So uh, we prioritized sewer repairs in those areas to make sure that we were removing any clean water from the system through sewer repairs. Um, the sewers were then prioritized for repairs over the next five years and 10 years based on their business risk and their I&I. &I. Um, and we're, we recommended about $60,000 a year for collection system repairs, and that's both on the pipes and the manholes, which is pretty close to what's in your current budget, what was, what's in your current budget for collection system repairs. Um, the city also has two pump stations they operate and maintain, Frank Street and Maple North. Uh, Suez went through and did um, evaluations of those pump stations and rated the mechanical, electrical, and overall aesthetics of, of um, the pumps and entered the results in the city's asset management software. And um, I would mention now, the asset management software is another benefit of this grant. Uh, the Suez was able to purchase an asset management software, so they'll be able to better track the assets at the plant and in the pump stations moving forward, and that was all part of the grant. So they enter all of these assets in into this program and can track them using this asset management software. Uh, the wastewater treatment plant condition assessment, there were 55 different categories of equipment that were reviewed. And again, rated based on mechanical, electrical, and aesthetics. Um, they did vibration testing at the plant to see how things were running. They did an oil analysis and then they entered all of those results in the city's asset management software as well. Like I said, we just did a couple additional inspections that weren't originally <coughs> anticipated at the grant, in the grant because there was money left over, so we're still analyzing all of those results before we come up with the final CIP for the plant. Um, we also did structural assessments on several large tanks at the wastewater treatment plant. We did the two aeration channels, uh, the equalization basin and the clarifiers. So we did the aeration channels back in 2016 and 2017, and then we did the clarifiers in the EQ basin 
here in the past month or so. So that's what we're still really looking at. Uh, these are just some photos from that, the clarifiers. Overall, they were in pretty good shape as far as the concrete and the structure is concerned. We do have some recommendations. You can see in the upper right-hand corner, there's some corrosion on some of the metal pieces. So to sandblast and coat those to extend their useful life. But overall, the concrete was in pretty good shape. Equalization basins, um, we did the inspections on those as well. Those ones, we did find a few more issues with, which we're still, still trying to quantify and put costs to. But there are some issues where the concrete needs to be patched or repaired. And there's um, some mechanical things that need to be addressed as well for the equalization basin. And then the aeration channels, again, those were mostly, those are the ones we did in 2016 and 2017, and they were, for the most part, in good shape. We do have some recommendations that we, uh, for minor patching, minor repairs over the next five to 10 years, but there's not immediate needs on those. Uh, the next thing we had to do, which is required by the SAW grant, was look at the level of service. So the level of service is basically how much do we want to spend to keep this system operating and running. And there's kind of two extremes. One, you can run everything to failure, where you're not investing any money into the plant or the system. You wait until there's major problems, and you pay for those repairs. The other end is we never, ever want to have a problem on any piece of equipment or any pipe in our system. And the run to failure means you're spending no money. And the we never, ever, ever want to have a problem means you're spending a lot of money. So most people are somewhere in between. So we developed a mission statement for the city of Wixom for its sanitary collection and treatment systems, which basically says the city wants to operate the system in the most cost-effective way possible while meeting all of your permit requirements and protecting public health and the environment. So um, the asset management program allows us to systematically identify assets most in need of repair, rehab or replacement, and then budget accordingly. So um, we did a funding study, worked with UFS on that, to make sure that you're collecting enough funding to maintain the system, and then looking at planned rate increases over the next few years to help continue to fund the system and do some of the capital improvements that are necessary. Um, so the projected final cost, again, the total amount was 2.5 million. Total SAW grant was $2 million. Right now, we're looking at, we're probably going to spend about $2.3 million of that $2.5 million. The reason we're not spending the full amount is because the cleaning and televising costs came in a lot less than we anticipated. So we actually did a lot more cleaning and televising already than we thought we were going to. We didn't think we'd be able to get through the whole city, but because the costs were so much less, we had Metro do just about everything that was eligible. Um, so we got kind of more bang for our buck at still a lesser cost. When we put the application together, we used a pretty conservative number. So, um, so there's about $130,000 left. There's a few more areas that Metro can televise. So Tim's working with them to get a few of those televised. Um, but we're probably going to be coming in a little bit under the grant budget just because we did everything we, were said, we said we were going to do and more. And, we don't want to just spend money for the sake of spending money. So the next steps um, to complete are finalize the condition reports for the wastewater treatment plant and the CIPP at the wastewater treatment plant. Um, submit the summary and, and certificate of completion to DEQ. Uh, finalize the asset management plan report and make it available for the city. And then ongoing is just make sure that the GIS the CMMS that, that Sue has purchased and all of the other asset management tools are updated regularly so that you can continue to utilize this plan. We don't want to just forget all the work we've done and, and ignore it moving forward. And that is the end of my presentation. So if you guys have any questions, I'll be happy to answer. Mr. Reza. A couple of them here on the um, GIS mapping. Yeah. So we've got several new subdivisions and businesses that are going to be going up here in the next few years. So something like Stone Ridge. Yes. Will the, G the location of all those manhole covers be added to the GIS database immediately? That's the plan. As soon as the as builds are done, they'll be added into that GIS so you have that information. Okay. And that includes any industrial? It includes any industrial. Any, any development, as soon as we get the as-built plans, they'll, they'll go into the GIS. 
So you think a, a SAW grant opportunity will be there 20 years from now when you know the, the face of the community will have changed enough to probably warrant doing it again? Um, I know that right now the state is very interested in infrastructure and I don't see infrastructure getting any better moving forward. I mean people are starting to invest in it now but it's still aging and there the DEQ it says that this was a DEQ grant program it was state money only there were no federal funds involved and they're looking at ways to fund these moving forward as well and they're also looking at ways to fund water asset management planning because this this grant program was not for drinking uh, drinking water at all it was just for sanitary and storm water so they're looking at options I can't say for sure whether it'll be available in the future but unlikely that this level of funding will be available. What the state really wanted to see done was communities take this money and invest in their system so that they can start looking at what their rate structure really needs to be to be more self-sustaining. We're past the days where you can get big construction grants for any of these types of projects. So they want want communities to start planning for the future. So unlikely that there will be another large-scale grant program like this. Thank you. Yeah. Anybody else? Well, thank you very much for the report, and I, I'm surprised that people don't come in looking for that report. <laughs> I mean, I think it's fascinating, yeah. personally, but not everyone shares my view. Uh, thank you very much. Well, I know about it. Yeah, that might be it, which is not well advertised, which is another well, good reason that we have this televised. And well, hey. Here you are. I would like it. I would love it if people came and looked at it. Yeah. We welcome anyone looking at it or commenting on it. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very Thank much. You okay. Um, next item on the agenda is the approval of the minutes. Uh, the regular city council meeting of October twenty third, two thousand eighteen. Do I have a motion? So moved. Support. Any uh, corrections, additions, uh, clarifications? Uh, we have a motion and a second. All in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, motion passes. Thank you. Um, correspondence, there is no correspondence, which leads us to uh, the first call to the public. Um, I'll read the rules for the call to the public. The public shall address the council during the call to the public, which shall be included on the agenda immediately after correspondence and again immediately after new business. The first call to the public immediately after correspondence shall be limited to agenda items only. A person shall not address the council in excess of five minutes unless the time is extended by a majority of, of uh, vote of, of the council present. Uh, persons wishing to address the council shall identify themselves in their place of residence and shall state their reason <coughs> for addressing council and all comments by the public shall be made directly to the council. Um, anybody wishing to speak to the council this evening on any agenda items? look familiar well I, I am <laughs> um, good evening gentlemen <clears throat> my name is Mike Dornan and I reside at 2192 Headingham Boulevard Wixom Michigan uh, I have to say it's probably going to be uh, I hope my presentation to you is to uh, hold your attention as well as uh, the saw grant update has and uh, I'm, I'm here this evening as a member of the <clears throat> tax abatement committee and I was looking at the agenda I hadn't looked at it until uh, now but I'm here to um, uh, make comments regarding new business item three <clears throat> the uh, recommendation to approve the brownfield agreement amendment number one um, uh, as requested by uh, uh, industrial commercial properties Inc to Cleveland Ohio and uh, their uh, uh, Detroit Wixom LLC. Um, as a member of the, the uh, tax abatement committee, um, I uh, drew the short straw this evening uh, after we met with uh, ICP on two occasions to come uh, uh, to the council 
and, and try to transmit to you uh, the feelings of the Tax Payment Committee in regard to <clears throat> the uh, Brownfield Amendment, uh, number one, uh, concerning the development, a redevelopment of uh, the, what we know as a Ford property. The, uh, I brought with me this evening a copy of the uh, Brownfield plan that was given to the uh, committee. Uh, at our first meeting, we, we met and we got to, got to know the, uh, the team. Uh, it was composed of representatives from ICP, uh, representative from uh, PM uh, Environmental, and uh, uh, I, I believe representatives from uh, Lang and Engineering uh, were also in attendance at that first meeting. Um, at that meeting, um, ICP, the team, uh, in the opinion of the Tax Payment Committee answered uh, the questions of the committee uh, directly, um, uh, immediately, and without holding back. And um, uh, at the second meeting, uh, the same was true uh, again. Uh, at the second meeting, we reviewed a, what uh, is a, a nine page uh, a brownfield plan. Uh, that I'm sure you have copies of, and um, <coughs> it was um, uh, put together in a manner that was concise, uh, to the point. It followed the state statute, uh, the Public Act uh, 381 of uh, 1996, and at the end of the presentation and after the committee asked their questions, um, it was resolved by the uh, committee to uh, make a recommendation to the city council to uh, uh, forward the uh, brownfield plan. With, um, with two uh, uh, cautionary comments. One being uh, what I'll refer to as the uh, 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 tax payment pylon. Uh, we talked about uh, uh, in the event that uh, the brownfield plan was approved and we talked about the length of time, and there was some heartburn regarding the length of time of the plan. And the good news is, is that uh, in the event that all the eligible activities are completed, um, and, uh, and less with, within uh, le the plan's estimates, projected cost estimates, or less, the, the brownfield would be closed out earlier. The, um, the tax abatement pylon concern of the committee uh, was relative uh, to a discussion that was held regarding, well, if, if by committee members, if the brownfield plan is granted and approved, what about, what about coming and, and taking a second bite, if you will, out of the apple for our, regarding tax abatement? And it's probably, and uh, in the opinion of the committee um, and your legal staff is probably um, um, probably unable to include a prohibition on future tax abatements within the brownfield plan as such. Uh, you may be able to find a mechanism um, outside of the brownfield plan if you approve it um, to incorporate some kind of language or mechanism regarding ta future tax abatement requests in a, a, a development agreement. No, this should you get that far, and I believe you will. Um, the, on a cautionary note, the future uh, tax payment applications, uh, in spite of a, the existence of a brownfield plan, um, may be interesting for the city to review over the course of the next 5, 10, 15, 20 years uh, during the life of the brownfield plan, based on uniqueness, the type of uh, uh, development that uh, is coming in and so forth. So it, it would be uh, hoove the city to keep one eye open regarding the total prohibition of tax abatements. But um, stranger things have happened uh, and the councils do change their mind over the course of periods of time occasionally. And the second caveat <coughs> that gave uh, 
that the committee wanted to transmit to uh, council was uh, that their, their sincere desire and interest that the zoning um, of the Ford property and the master plan be, <coughs> excuse me, be, um, be, be maintained and held intact. That uh, there, there was a uh, pretty lengthy discussion of uh, committee members regarding um, the, the requirement to minimize um, future retail development along um, Wixom Road. So as not to uh, uh, transform Wixom Road into a commercial um, retail strip that you see in other uh, neighboring suburban communities uh, in uh, metropolitan uh, and outside the uh, metropolitan Detroit area. Having said that, um, my, uh, those are my comments on behalf of the committee. I'd be happy to answer any questions that you may have. I did get the short stick, and uh, I hope you appreciate the, the committee's work. And uh, thanks for listening. That's it. Mr. Doran, I, my, my recollection of the um, committee meeting too was that there, there was some discussion uh, with, uh, with one of the principals that was um, phoned in about the, uh, his, his comments relative to uh, um, not um, double dipping, if you will. It, uh, uh, do, you wanna, do you wanna address that? Um, you... And uh, as a matter of fact, the, uh, uh, the representative from um, IPC or ICP uh, is here, Mr. Salada, who was on the phone uh, with us uh, at that meeting. And uh, I, get, I, I also point out that what you say is uh, correct, uh, Mr. Mayor, that uh, Mr. Salada confirmed that it was not uh, in the interest or uh, ICP's interest to um, uh, request uh, uh, tax, future tax payments and piling on, if you will. And I would point out to uh, you that on page four of the, uh, I think it's page four, of the uh, uh, Brownfield plan, uh, paragraphs two, three, four, and five outline really the vision um, of ICP uh, regarding this 182 acres located in Wixom, Michigan. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Anybody else wishing to address the council this evening on any agenda items? Uh, seeing no one, um, I will close the uh, first call to the public. Uh, next item on the agenda are, are the uh, city manager's report, uh, of which there are two this evening. The first is the fire monthly report of September 2018. <coughs> Anybody have any questions? Uh, second is the um, police monthly report for September 2018. Anybody? Okay. Uh, next item on the agenda is the consent agenda. All items listed under the consent agenda are considered routine by the city council and will be enacted by one motion. There will be no separate discussion of these items unless a council member so requests, in which event, the items will re be removed from the consent agenda and added to the regular agenda at the end of unfinished or new business. Do I have a motion? So moved. Support. I have a motion and a support. All in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, motion passes. Um, there is no unfinished business uh, taking us to new business. First item under new business is a consideration of the 2019-2020 Community Development Block Grant Program allocation in the amount of $42,343. Do I have a motion? So moved. Support. Uh, Deanna, please. Hardly seems that another year has gone by. We seem to, this time of year, always address this, this issue. As I stated before, when we opened the public hearing, um, the Black Grant Program does provide funds for the purpose of renovating older homes, revitalizing neighborhoods, and providing human services for low to moderate income areas. 
In the report, you noticed I, I detailed out that the maximum you can give to public services is 30%. So that number of 12,702 can be broken down in many ways. I've given you um, a recommendation. Uh, however, that is up to city council to determine which public service agencies they would like to fund. Anybody? Mr. Smiley. Hi, Dan. Hi. Um, just, just to clarify, and I ask this question every year. Now I know, but I just want to make sure it's clear for everybody that there's classifications for where this can be distributed. We can't just split it up five ways. Correct. Because there's certain uh, categories that they, that the, the couple fall into the same category, and they have to be all to one. Correct. The maximum public services um, categories, um, there's like a senior category, a <coughs> battered and abused, a youth category, etc. but you can only fund three. Yeah. And our solution has been to basically alternate every other three years. Yes. We have tried to rotate the emergency yeah. services and some of the other services. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? Yeah. And, I, and each year we, we do say, say the same thing over and over. We, we would like to... I, Personally, I'd like to just take the total amount available and split it up with uh, every group that, that has applied. And, but unfortunately, the rules that they put on us uh, just don't enable us to do that. Uh, and so years ago, several years ago, we, we decided that what we would do is rotate the, the um, allocations and, uh, and, and that way that's about as fair as we can get but I uh, wish we could give uh, give it to everybody and, uh, and, and uh, do it a different way um, we have a motion and a second uh, all in favor please signify by saying aye aye opposed motion passes thank you Deanna thanks for all of you that came out tonight to to give us a little review of your programs um, next item on the agenda uh, is a recommendation to approve the Community Development Block Grant Program Year 2018 sub, sub recipient Agreement between Oakland County and the City of Wixom and authorize the Mayor to sign the agreement on behalf of the City. Do I have a motion? No. Support? I have a motion and support. Just so you realize, this is the agreement from the funds that you allocated last year. Right. Anybody? Questions? Comments? Thank you, Dan. I have a motion and a second. All in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion passes. Um, next item on the agenda is a um, uh, recommendation to approve the Brownfield Plan Amendment number 01 for the 182.53 acres of property located at 29311 South Wixom Road for up to um, I, I, am I reading the wrong one? I'm reading the wrong one. I think I need that. I need that. To, yeah, I'm sorry. Let me start that over. Again. Actually, you're the same up to that point. You're good. Yeah. Um, recommendation to approve the Brownfield Amendment number one for the uh, 182.53 acres of property located at uh, 29311 South Wixom Road for up to uh, 19.4 million in eligible costs or for up to 30 years, whichever comes first, subject to the final action and approval by the Oakland County Brownfield Redevelopment Authority and the Board of Commissioners. Do I have a motion? So moved. Support. Okay. <coughs> Brown. So we have a, a wide array of resources at our disposal tonight. We're appreciative of that. We have uh, Brad Hansen of uh, Oakland County Economic Development and Community Affairs uh, and of the Oakland County Brownfield Redevelopment Authority. Uh, we have Chris Salata, who was mentioned earlier by Mr. Dornan, who is the uh, Chief Operating Officer of ICP Properties, the new uh, owners of uh, the former Fort Wixom plant property. Uh, also with uh, Mr. Salata is Jessica DeBone of PM Environmental, who is the uh, architect, if you will, of the uh, Brownfield Plan Amendment Number 1 that we're looking at this evening. Uh, we also had uh, Mike Dornan of uh, the Tax Abatement Review Committee here earlier, and I'm sure he'd answer a ton of questions if we allowed him at him, so he'll be here as well. And then we have our own Deborah Barker um, as well. Um, so with that background, uh, in case we need to draw on anybody's expertise, uh, I'd be happy to, to, to defer to anybody as needed. Um, but we've gone through this process up, up to now that uh, Mr. Dornan covered a little bit in his remarks where they've, they've come before the Tax Abatement Review Committee. Um, 
this is a uh, situation where there's going to be action happening um, if this is ultimately approved by the city of Wixom as well as by the uh, Oakland County Brownfield Redevelopment Authority. A um, little bit of an update to what's reflected in the uh, wording of the report. Uh, the Oakland County Brownfield Redevelopment Authority actually acted uh, before we did um, with a resolution that uh, supports the idea of a brownfield plan uh, amendment number one for this property as well. So we're on the same page uh, to this point, assuming that we get support for the report uh, recommendation tonight. Um, basically, a brownfield redevelopment uh, is, is a brownfield plan is a way to facilitate redevelopment of a property that has issues. Um, and our Ford Wixon plant property certainly had its fair share of issues in that front. Um, the idea is that there'll be eligible costs that the developer is going to undertake uh, to develop the property. And uh, if, a, if a brownfield plan is approved, um, those eligible costs would be subject to reimbursement through tax capture uh, in the long run. Um, basically, uh, there'd be a, a base value that's going to be set at the beginning of the process. Uh, as the property is developed and as, uh, as the taxable value increases, that additional tax capture on that increase in taxable value will then be paid back to the developer for costs incurred for the property. It could be soil remediation and removal, uh, it could be vapor barriers, it could be um, special utility requirements that are needed in certain situations, such as the one that we might be looking at with the Ford Wixom plant property. Um, they've got a, a laundry list of, of millions of dollars of expenses that they have uh, forecast as potential expenses, um, and that's basically assuming uh, that each property is going to require a very high level of, of intermediation and remediation um, by ICP and anybody that's going to utilize the property uh, through their redevelopment of the property. So uh, what we have before us is a, is a amendment number one that's recommending that um, we proceed with this brownfield plan uh, to facilitate the redevelopment of this critical property in town. Uh, and that will allow the reimbursement of these eligible costs, which are uh, basically identified at about $19.4 million total, and that consists of those eligible costs for ICP, as well as about $150,000, or excuse me, $130,000 uh, for reimbursement of administrative expenses to Oakland County, as they're going to basically serve to uh, uh, administer the brownfield if it's approved in the long run. Um, so those two pieces make up that $19.4 million. My recommendation is that we uh, approve this Brownfield Plan Amendment number one uh, for that $19.4 million or for up to 30 years, um, whichever comes first. Because if the costs are less, um, they could be reimbursed less. Uh, if we don't get to the full reimbursement of the cost by the year 30 mark, we would also recommend that we would end the Brownfield Plan under that scenario. So it's up to that $19.4 million or up to 30 years. Uh, there's lots of other details. I'm happy to, to talk about any other questions that people have on it, but I also don't want to go into too much detail on it if we, if we have a pretty good understanding of the plan that's before us. Um, so it's my recommendation, it's, it's uh, city administration's recommendation that we proceed um, with, the, with the Brownfield Plan Amendment Number 1 uh, for that $19.4 million or the 30 years, whichever comes first. Okay, um, questions? Mr. Resnick. Okay, I'll start. <laughs> I got a couple questions. Uh, number one, the uh, I was reading in the minutes, uh, Mr. Slada, you might be able to uh, shed some light on this. The, the agreement then with the predecessor in the state is that the first phase of the project, that's the, the, paint, the old paint shop basements, that part of it is as soon as the remediation plan is approved by the state, you will commence that work and, and appropriate permits from the city. You'll commence that work, and that's independent of this. Is that, that yes, correct? Yes, that work is ineligible for reimbursement through the Brownfield tip. So let me first say good evening, gentlemen. Thank you for having us this evening, Mayor. It's a pleasure to finally meet you and, and, the, and the rest of the council. Um, city Manager Brown and Economic Development Director Barker, as well as all the other uh, members of the Tax Abatement Committee have we, we really enjoyed our, our initial conversations and our relationship with the city, and we look forward to the future success alongside of you as our partners here. Um, to clarify the answer to your question, um, and for everyone's edification, the, our predecessors, the, the our sellers of this property, uh, when they did demolish the, uh, the, the former stamping plan, um, they pushed construction debris into the basement of the uh, former paint building. And that debris, we believe, was made up predominantly of uh, steel, concrete, uh, typical construction demolition debris. 
as a result, that basement, as you've noticed, has started to fill up with water. Um, we, we refer to it as Lake Wilson. Um, <laughs> and uh, our first order of business um, has been to put together a remediation plan for the removal of that water as well as that debris. Um, it's a lot more difficult than you would think because of the previous lawsuits that were in place with uh, MDEQ and with Ford. Both of those lawsuits, for everyone's information, were dismissed at the closing of our acquisition in May of this past year. And, and the seller of this property paid a pretty hefty fine uh, to the state of Michigan um, as a result of creating this open landfill. Um, so in order to properly dispose of that water, which by the way, we have done um, a, a ton of testing on and feel very good about the, uh, the nature of that water. So to dispose of that water and that debris, that was part of our agreement with MDEQ when we closed. Uh, so that is a responsibility of industrial commercial properties, Detroit Wixom uh, LLC, our entity that owns the site. We have to take care of that. 100% of those costs are on us uh, or else we get ourselves in hot water with the state. So. Uh, no pun intended. We've got to do that work first, and that's our first order of business. We have a remediation plan that we have currently in front of MDEQ for their <coughs> sign off and approval. We've been working closely with your city officials uh, because some of that, uh, the disposal and removal of that is obviously going to require a permit from the city of Wixom. Um, it's our hope that shortly after Thanksgiving, we're actually out there on site performing that work. The second phase, just so while we're talking about it, so we're all on the same page, second phase of work there after we remove that water and the debris is to actually remove the remaining concrete slab of the plant well what you see as you drive by there all that concrete is going to come up um, in order to have this site development ready come spring of 19 which is our ultimate goal we've got to take that concrete up that work is eligible uh, for the tip uh, reimbursement through the tip the problem is we can't start that work until the tip is in place because if we started it early without the TIF in place, then we would lose the ability to be reimbursed for that. So I call it phase one and phase two, um, but our, our ultimate goal, as I said, is to have this uh, site development ready come spring of 19. So no issues in getting, uh, that you can foresee in getting your remediation plan for the phase one with we're the jumping, state. We're jumping through the hurdles right now. We feel pretty confident that we should have uh, work back from DEQ here, um, if not before the holiday shortly thereafter. Super. Um, okay, and I, you know, I, I think in general, I think uh, TIFs and, and you know, this is another tool in our toolbox, as uh, I think Mr. Dornan used to say, uh, for uh, getting a lot of this redevelopment done. We've been sitting here now for how many years with this, you know, the, this the ruins, if you will, of the, of the Ford site. So um, I, I found it interesting going through the pages and pages and pages of the industrial history of the site. I mean, it was it's fascinating to, to see what what a auto plant can leave behind, right, in terms of an environmental mess. And uh, it, it was very fascinating. And, you know, I, I'm hopeful as well in reading that uh, a vapor barrier wouldn't have to be provided for anything because that's $16.8 million of the entire amount that's earmarked for um, the vapor and utility jacketing and things like that that would have to go on. So hopefully a lot of that won't have to happen. Um, ICP has a, a long history of rehabilitating these types of properties. So I think that's, a, that's another plus. And um, I think we need to use this tool to get things rolling here. And um, I, I'm very much in favor of this. Um, I think that it will be good for Wixom and surrounding businesses and our, and our home uh, developments. Um, I also am concerned about the double dipping and I'm, I'm glad to see that there might be ways of doing that with the you know subsequent development agreements that come after after the property itself is uh, remediated and, and, and ready for development so we'll have to cross those bridges when we come to them but uh, that is of concern yeah and perhaps I could address that as the mayor asked that of, of uh, Mike when he was up here earlier you know, I, I think we need to try to maintain the flexibility only because, as uh, I'm sure everyone is aware, uh, the build to suit environment for industrial and manufacturing right now in the Metro Detroit area is very active. Uh, there's a lot of businesses that are continuing to thrive and grow that are looking for land just like the one we have uh, right outside here. Um, we are competing with a lot of the neighboring communities to attract those users. Um, and as Con Councilman Resnick just said, Having as many tools in our toolkit to support attracting those businesses and those end users, I think, is important. That said, I don't think it's the intent of our our, our company and the ownership group uh, to 
stack those on top of one another. Um, there, this, this development of the site, as we start to remediate things, um, let's, let's talk about the removal of the slab, we'll start kind of from the north to the south. And as we begin that remediation, um, I think you'll see the development will start in that same direction. Uh, particularly, there's particular interest from end users, um, particularly industrial and office users, that want to be along Wixel Road. For obvious reasons, access, visibility are terrific. There is the ability and the unique nature of this site, there is the ability to tap into the rail system, uh, which, abuts our, which abuts the property. Um, so I think you'll find that as we start to develop this by phases, um, there may be a particular user that is very interested in the abatement, and that may be the hook that we may need to bring them to this site. If that's the case, we're gonna have to come before the city council again. We're gonna have to have that discussion. We're gonna have to have that discussion with the develop, uh, economic development team uh, within the city. And my, my hope and thought would be that as we kind of take this down in pieces and develop this, um, there could be some flexibility between whether or not the brownfield TIF uh, and or an abatement is, is utilized. It's, it's one or the other in our, in our opinion. Um, to give you an example, let's say there was a user that wanted that first 10, the first 10 acres to the north. There was a build-a-suit opportunity to do, say, a 150, 200,000 square foot facility, bring a couple hundred employees to the city, <coughs> and needed that abatement for 10 to 12 years in order to make that happen, to make it a more attractive site than one, say, in Novi. Um, in that instance, what I think we could probably explore was a way to either carve back the TIF or anything that's developed on those particular 10 acres not be submitted for TIF reimbursement as it relates to that particular development. Um, and as we go, I think you'll find it'll be, it'll be developed in pieces such that we can have a pretty intelligent conversation as it relates to that. And we, we would endeavor as the owners to commit to that um, and commit to those conversations with the city as we go. But I think it would be uh, prudent of all of us um, as partners on this project to keep that uh, tool available in case it, it's what's required to bring a particular user to the site. Anyone else? Any questions? Uh, you got uh, um, people from Oakland County here, uh, others. Uh, appreciate everybody coming out. Um, there are no other questions. Um, we have a uh, motion and a second. All in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, motion passes. Thank you very much. Thank you. Welcome to Wixom. Appreciate it. We, we really look forward to uh, to doing business with you. Having you develop and prosper. Thanks. Um, next item on the agenda is uh, the second call to the public. Um, I'll just open up the second call to the public. Uh, everybody already heard the rules, so I don't see anybody jumping up. I guess everybody's tired. All right, I'll close the second call to the public. Uh, next item on the agenda is the city manager's comments. Mr. Brown. Thank you, Your Honor. A couple things I'll highlight. Um, we have um, some information from the clerk's office, uh, who's exhausted still post-election. Mm -hmm. um, congratulations to Kathy Buck and Crystal Apalco and everybody who uh, chipped in to make uh, that a successful, if challenging, general election cycle that we just experienced. Um, so I wanted to talk about some of the statistics that uh, were provided by the clerk um, for that November 6th election. There were 6,120 Wixom residents that cast their vote. Uh, 4,286 voted in person, while 1,834 voted by absentee ballot. Uh, that makes up about 59% of our uh, registered voters. Um, for comparison's sake, uh, this uh, prior presidential election two years ago, um, the city of Wixom issued 1,909 absentee ballots. Uh, and in this uh, midterm election, typically not nearly as busy, we issued 1,908 absentee ballots, so a difference of one. Um, we had uh, a very presidential turnout type of uh, election here in these midterm election that we just experienced, and I wanted to say congratulations to Kathy Buck and to uh, Crystal Opalco for, uh, for surviving and uh, for doing a great job on it. Um, lots of lots of work, lots of extra hours for those folks, and. Um, all went very smoothly and we appreciate that. <coughs> um, the Public Safety Department, we have some information that was sort of uh, mentioned earlier by one of our visitors uh, when we were discussing uh, requests for funding under the uh, CDBG program. 
Um, we uh, do have stuff a squad car uh, effort going on uh, at, at front of the police department right now. Um, I teased uh, our director of public safety about whether I was sure that was a legal parking spot, but we do have a squad car that's parked in front of the uh, police department. Uh, it's very well marked uh, soliciting donations of toys and other things uh, to uh, fill that car up and to provide uh, gifts to be donated to the hospitality house for the people that they serve at their annual Santa shop, um, which is going to take place on Saturday, December 15th. Um, over 600 children will ultimately be served by that Santa shop, and we're looking forward to seeing what kind of generosity Wixom generates um, for this Stuff a Squad Car initiative that uh, Police uh, Chief and Director of Public Safety Ron Moore came up with. Uh, so we encourage people to take part of that. It's hard to miss it out here in front of our City Hall campus, so take a look uh, and please participate with that. Uh, other than that, um, we, did have, uh, we did have a, rec a, rec a recognition uh, by um, Wald Lake uh, Community School District uh, Community uh, Foundation for Excellence that was provided to our DDA for allowing them to participate in one of their fine events. Uh, and they realized uh, just about $400 in fundraising benefit from that, and they were appreciative of that and passed on their uh, appreciation to Deborah Barker uh, for that. Uh, and pass it on to the DDA as well. So I uh, wanted to make mention of that as well. Uh, other than that, uh, there's a variety of things going on um, this month. Uh, we have some exciting stuff coming up here uh, in our community services department. We've got a uh, uh, newly improved tree lighting ceremony that's gonna happen on November 30th. Uh, we encourage people to come out for that and see a uh, fantastic new 30-foot tree that we uh, have uh, purchased and are ready to have on display and uh, lit up on that November 30th. So that's uh, one of the events that's listed in the calendar of events. There's many more in there. I, take, I request that you take a look at that uh, and um, look forward to attending a lot of great events coming up in the city. Other than that, if there's anything anybody would like to ask or inquire about, I'd do my best to answer the questions. Okay, thank you. Well, um, next item on the agenda are the uh, council comments. Mr. Gosham. I don't have any tonight, thank you. Okay. Mr. Leader. Um, wanted to welcome our newest police officer, Officer Hess. Um, congratulations on the election, smooth as usual. Uh, other than that, I don't have anything else. Thank you. Mr. Smiley. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, just a couple of uh, items of appreciation. Uh, the, uh, I mentioned this to Mr. Doran earlier, the tax abatement uh, committee putting the, you know they their presentation their minutes helped flush out a lot of the questions you know on the uh, brownfield uh, uh, item on our agenda and I want to thank them you know you're on it too I think yeah so thank you for your thanks for uh, you know making our jobs easy with uh, you know that uh, thorough questions uh, you mentioned stuff the police car I'm excited about that that's a good thing thank you again Kathy for your hard work on the election and that just leaves uh, Happy Thanksgiving next week, Tom. Thank you. Mr. Resnick. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I um, also want to welcome aboard uh, our newest officer, Eric Hess, and uh, his family here. Uh, that's great. The um, very interesting, uh, last night, the Historical Society had a program on the Edmund Fitzgerald, hosted by uh, Rick Mixter, who's now a Wixom resident. He did all the PBS documentaries on the wreck of the Edmund Fitzgerald and other shipwrecks. Fascinating program. I mean, it, this this room was filled, literally front to back. I think uh, well, the mayor and I were ready to sit up here in our seats yeah. to give up our seats for a few people. But um, th these programs are getting very, very interesting. Uh, you know, the prior one that I attended was on the uh, the Walled Lake Amusement Park and the history of it uh, that Kathy Crawford gave. So. I encourage everybody to come out and, uh, and listen to these things. Uh, they're quite, uh, quite exciting, <laughs> and really are. Um, also, uh, you know, the I know that um, a lot of the folks that are here for the CBD <coughs> funds, uh, you know, we, we do try to do a, a good balancing act. I know Deanna and her team do a, a good balancing act with other communities to make sure that there's a fair share that go around. Um, I just want to. Mention as well that there are uh, local businesses that also do fundraising efforts uh, for these um, uh, nonprofits, and, and, and please continue to work with those local businesses in, in, in your fundraising activities. With that, uh, happy Thanksgiving, everyone. Thank you. Um, yeah, I, I would agree uh, with Mr. Resnick's assessment of that presentation last night. It was very 
fascinating and it was um, it was packed and I was I told uh, the people that put it on the the uh, historical society uh, members I said I was envious of them because they had a packed house and it was 90 people imagine uh, and and nobody was yelling at you I mean that was that was really nice um, so that was a, a very fascinating uh, uh, presentation but another one that's going on this this weekend uh, last weekend and this weekend there's a, a uh, play that uh, Wall Lake Western is putting on. It's uh, their version of Fiddler on the Roof. It's an excellent, excellent uh, presentation. I've seen the play several times in other places and this, and, and, the, and the movie too, but this, this is really a, a special presentation and I would encourage anybody that uh, um, can go there to get over and see that this weekend. Uh, it's on Friday night, Saturday night, and uh, I think Sunday afternoon. Um, so it's really good. Um, uh, again, Kathy, congratulations on another flawless election, uh, and thanks to all your workers and co your your uh, um, volunteers that come in. Uh, I know I know uh, I have personal friends with one of the people who was brand new this year, and she she was scared stiff after the training, but then when she went to the uh, went to the and, and did the did her job there, she really loved it, and she's, she'll be back next year to help out. So uh, the only other thing that uh, of a business. Um, that I wanted to talk about is um, I've, I've talked to city manager a little bit about the um, legalized marijuana um, that was passed here and how that might impact us. And I know that we've, uh, you know, listening to blurbs on the radio, some communities have opted out. I don't know. Usually, what happens uh, when things like this uh, occur? Uh, there's a, a waiting period, and the, the legislature is allowed to come up with rules and regulations and. Um, I, but I do know that some communities have already uh, taken the initiative to notify whoever they're supposed to notify uh, that they, their community wants to opt out. And um, I, would, I would encourage uh, the city manager to take a close look at that and see if there's something that I'm, I'm going to make a, I, I don't know how the rest of my fellow council members feel, but I think it would be um, a good idea if we were uh, one of the communities that opted out uh, of that of, of having to, to entertain um, business licenses um, for that. I know we can't do anything about uh, people driving through with it or, uh, you know, but I, I think we should do everything we can to try to, try to protect our citizens and, and, and uh, make sure that we make every effort to do that. And again, I'm saying that I'm not sure what everywhere else stands on that issue, but I, I think it would be helpful to take a look. And if anybody else like to chime in, I, you know, one comment that the, um, you know, as opposed to the medical marijuana, initially there was no guidance for communities, and, and we are allowed to opt out, and, and I would also support that. And you, I, I agree with the idea of looking into what it takes to opt out, yes. Anybody else? Yeah, yeah no, I'm good. The, um, actually, I saw in the um, Michigan Municipal League emails, they have an event was planning to go December 4th in Westland. It looks like they didn't have a, a location or time on their website, but I did already put that in my calendar today, at least because it's specifically about that issue. So I don't know if anybody wants to join me down there. Yeah, if you, I don't know. Yeah, if you could uh, get that information, because it's probably on their website. Yeah, we'll make sure to pass that on. I've seen the same communication. Uh, for the uh, information of merit council, we're going to be looking at a, a variety of information on that front, talking with our legal counsel, and making sure we get that that uh, that step forward that we want to take on that uh, prepared with a recommendation to council as soon as possible, just to be, get some clarity as soon as possible. Um, I would say that we do need to get some uh, additional information. There's lots of uh, lots of good information that's coming out, out about it, but I imagine there'll be more information that's coming out about it to make sure that we do it in the right fashion. Um, from a timing standpoint, they mentioned that the uh, regulatory agency at the state uh, is going to be required to, to either have a process in place within 12 months or if they don't, um, would be uh, entrepreneurs would be able to approach the city directly um, for um, their request for licensing as, a, as an establishment for that kind of uh, business activity. So we do have a period of time that's certainly in front of us, but I see no reason to delay on that any longer than is necessary to come up with the right steps to, to bring forward for a recommendation to council, and that's going to be what I'm going to commit to. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Having said all that, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Motion and a second. All in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. aye.
Aye. Aye. Opposed? Go home, everybody.